tell us a little bit more about Ami in the show. Ami. Uh, Ami um, is an overstayer. <laughs> She's an overseas Filipino worker, but she started uh, as a tourist, I think, in Australia, and then she overstayed her visa. She thought it was just going to work out, and it kind of didn't. And uh, yeah, so that's that's her the arc of her story is trying to work through that through the show, how she navigates that with everything that ha that happens around her. I feel that Ami's story, particularly for a lot of um, not just Filipinos, but a lot of migrants who yeah. come to Australia, it's quite it's not an uncommon story. It's a it's a Filipino arc. You know, like uh, if you're not a nurse, you come here as a tourist and then you work and in the hope of getting a visa. A lot of Australian born and just Australians in general, I feel don't really understand the notion of having to leave your country to find better opportunities. Um, you mm. know how a lot of people say you that have to live it to understand it. It's, uh, can you just imagine, I mean, put yourself in, for example, um, army shoes, you've got, and, and, and EV shoes, you've got these beautiful family, you've got kids, and to not see them every day, and you have to look after other people's children, you'll just be so lonely. <laughs> you know, I came to Australia when I was um, 16, and I felt so lonely and displaced and I was 16 you know I was a teenager what about these women who have family over there I just want to dig deeper on this though because I think Australians yeah. just don't understand yeah um, you know this this concept of of migrating to another country mm. with your kids not being with you and having mm. to send money know, to send money mm. you know I feel that this is a very um, I mean, I only know this as a, as a Filipino, but yeah. I'm sure that there's so many uh, people, uh, a lot of different migrants who yes. experience this. Yes. I can only speak from, from experience as in, uh, I mean, with my mom, for example, she came here first and then I was in the Philippines for, for six months and then I followed her. I just know that she was, she missed me a lot and she was very lonely because you know, a mother's love. How can you not look after your kids every day if you're a true mother? And do you think just with all that into consideration with Ami's character, do you find any similarities with her? Absolutely. I think, she, yeah, I think she's lucky in a way that she lives with Roxanne because it means that she gets treated uh, because, you know, they're supposed to be friends and, and she gets treated a bit better. You understand? Like she's got a place to stay and Roxanne is supporting Ami a lot, you know, emotionally as well, even though, you know, not as close as Ami would like it to be because Roxanne too has got things to do with her life and it's very complicated. Um, but uh, Ami, I would, th I would say, would send 80%, at least 80% of her money to the Philippines for her kids. Tell me a little bit more about your childhood. So in the Philippines, like I grew up in a little town called, it's actually not little, it's a city now, it's called Navotas, which is a, a, a fishing town. And I grew up uh, being an only child, but I was surrounded by cousins and aunties and uncles and grandparents and a uh, whole community. So, and my mother was, um, she was a school teacher at the time. And uh, so she was bringing up uh, an uncle and an auntie and myself. And she was the sole breadwinner of those three kids. So that was hard. And so we were definitely not on the poverty line, but money was tight. We had, um, you know, we had food all the time, but just food, not, you know, I was a big eater as a kid and I still am, <laughs> you know, as a kid, I would, I would play this game to myself. I'd go, when I tasted something really yummy, a fruit or a dessert or during Christmas, like I would say to myself, when I get rich, I'm going to eat 
chocolate and grapes and like endless amount and I don't care you know like I will just eat it and you know it's interesting because when I came to Australia at 16 and I ate chocolate like there was no tomorrow grapes like you know oranges and all that <laughs> because in the Philippines I thought if you can do that if you can do that that means that you won't have any more problems in life like you can just eat however you want you have running water you have a shower what more could you want and then I came here and then I, I had that and I was like wow you know the first few months we've got running water we don't have to go to the well and 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 fetch water and use stubble you know that that bucket to 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 clean yourself and um, have as much food as you want and and guess what you have different <laughs> sets of problems <laughs> you know and that was a really good learning curve for me you think you know what you want and that it would solve everything but in actual fact it's not about that it's not it's not like that <laughs> what different set of problems i didn't feel that i belonged in australia that these are not my people that no one knows me they don't get me and and uh, and then I experienced when I came here. I experienced racism for the first time. Like I saw, I was going to TAFE studying accounting, and I was on a bus, and we were um, just going along. And I saw this big graffiti on the wall says, "You know, Asians go home." I was in 1984, and I it was the first time, and it was weird because I. I had never experienced racism before and and I was watching myself and I felt embarrassed in front of everybody like it was a packed bus and I didn't want to look at people because I'm sure people saw that sign too and I thought so does that mean that people here don't like me so the who, who can I trust I also hung out with the Jewish community, the Russian Jewish community in Australia because my mother married a Russian Jewish Australian and we, were li we lived in Bondi and uh, you know we'd go to Bondi all dolled up and, and I was like and then I saw the other people on the beach like dressed like you know in their flip flops <laughs> and were dressed to the nines. <laughs> yeah that was that was um, that's a funny funny thing um, but yeah um, I was sad but all and felt uh, very displaced because also in the Philippines the, the doors are open. You know, when we're at home, the windows and doors are open. And here, I just really felt that, that people, they're more about themselves. It's not about community. I straight away felt that, that there's not like community in the Philippines. And I was sure that I thought there must be some sort of community here, but not like how it is in the Philippines, you know, within the kilometer radius, you know, people, you know, almost everybody. And here, I, we didn't even know our neighbors. And that was really a big shock for me and, and sad because I thought, oh my God, I've lost that part of my life now forever. And I have to basically live a different life and really find the joy that's here. You know what I mean? Like just say goodbye to that life and just build my life now with people I don't know and, and culture that I don't know about. And yeah, that, that, was, that was huge. Did, and you, did you find that joy? So it took me two years, right? Within those two years, I was always thinking I'd love to go back to the Philippines and and at the time, I was 17 already, I, there was just this energy of that I wanted to sing. I wanted to sing. And, and I said to mom, I want to take singing lessons. And she said, no, 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 just it's better for you if you go, went back home and studied at the conservatorium in the Philippines. So I kind of, you know, did odd jobs while I, w while I was studying accounting. <laughs> And, and, you know, being told, oh, you know, that's just for a hobby. Singing, that's just for a hobby. I would lock myself in my room and just pretend that I was singing in front of a big audience. Most nights. Yeah. And, uh, 
So that went on for two years. And then um, after two years, something clicked. I was like, oh my God, like I actually love that people, not everyone know, knows who you are. It means that you can just be, that you can just, that you can, you don't have to answer to a whole group of people, to, to your community, because it means that you, you have the time to actually discover who you want to be. And, and I thought, that means that I can just, you know, create, create who I am, and I don't, I don't have to answer to anyone. And, and I started singing lessons, and you know, and met some Filipinos actually who I w hung out with, and um, and then there was that burning desire to be a, to be a singer, and and uh, amazingly, I met this um, woman. She's a uh, half Maori, half Scottish, and she started teaching me, si you know, singing lessons and also stagecraft because she worked she worked around the clubs in in Sydney. And she said to me, you need to practice, you need to join uh, singing competitions in the clubs. And, and that's how I started. And, and luckily I won a few and then I got an agent. What was it like for you uh, transitioning into or getting into acting later in life? Oh, you know, okay. Because that stereotype that, you know, we all start young and... Yeah. yeah what was that like? Yeah, so I went, um, when I was 26, there came a point that... Um, I was getting a lot of jobs, like singing, like in the cruise ships as well, um, and and I thought, and then I saw Miss Saigon, and I thought, oh my God, that's what I want to be. I actually want to be acting and singing and dancing on stage. So I remember it's so um, very clear. I was I was working um, again in accounting, just sitting there counting all the money that the company had taken for the day. I was working at a duty free shop. And I had that thought, I thought, I don't care. I don't actually care about this job and it's killing me. And so I picked up the phone, I called up WAPA, because I, I had a look at, um, I'd been watching a lot of musical theater at the time and, and um, saw that they, that a lot of them graduated from the Western Australian Academy of Performing Arts. So I called them and I said, when, how do you take in applicants and they told me that they were going to have an audition in six months and I need to sing two contrasting songs and two um, contrasting monologues. I worked with someone for six months, got the two monologues, got the two songs and I auditioned and, and got in. So, but it was mus a musical theatre course and I loved it. And you know, there was a, an acting, of course, a very big acting component in the show. I mean, in the, in the um, uh, course. But I, I was interested, but I just thought I'm not good enough to be an actor. I, I really thought that. I thought I, I'm a, I, I can sing, I know that, but acting, I don't know. And you know, we had Shakespeare and all that. But funnily enough, after I graduated, my second job after I graduated was um, uh, an acting job in New Zealand. And I was there for about a year and a half. But still, I wasn't, I wasn't passionate about acting. <laughs> And then five years ago, I started getting these incredible roles and I was like, oh my God, I, c I can do this. So I started um, yeah, getting more serious and I'm studying again, I'm studying acting again. What inspired you about Ami, Ami's role? Well, because I know the story. I know, I know from friends and, and, and talking to Filipinos who are uh, doing, um, you know, helping jobs in Australia, overstayers and, and I just thought that that is an incredible uh, story that needs to be told. You know my favourite part, as the show progressed, I really loved uh, seeing your rela Army's relationship with Roxanne. Yeah. yeah. And she's <laughs> it's like you were, I don't know whether it was more, what, do you think it was more like an ate sort of relationship or, or tita relationship? This is it's actually think? not that. It was more ate with Evie. Evie saw me as an ate. With, with Roxette, it was more like a sister mm. on equal fo footing. Mm. That's how I saw it. And I think that's how she saw it as well. Mm. As, the sto you know, as we can see, working for your friend slash sister is not that... Uh, 
it, it's complicated because I, I work for her. In essence, that sisterhood that you and Roxanne yes, had yes. really just reminded me of, look, I just look at you and I today. We had all these, you know, <laughs> amazing chats before this interview. Yes. And it's just this, and uh, this is what, n I just feel that non-Filipinos don't fully oh, understand this. Just instant connection. The instant connection that we have. Yes. Isn't that interesting? I don't know what that's about actually but every time it's interesting because like you and I we met and said you know I, I I'm willing to tell you everything Filipino yes I have that connection but more so Filipinas I feel that we're sisters it's just that 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 we're connected and I'm willing to share with you and I'm willing to be open with you and I'm willing to help you and I don't know where that comes from and i think well if i th if i if i really think about it i think it's it's that um upbringing of 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 sharing and and community and family that's i think yeah i mean the show is a little bit pissed off with roxanne she thinks that um you know i mean i don't want to give too much away but um, but they have that and Roxanne certainly feels that she's there for army 100% what what makes Filipina women unique I think peop our listeners would just uh, and I feel that the show portrays parts of that yeah, yeah what, what, what makes Filipina women Unique. Oh well, because you know there's a word in um, Philippine in the in Filipino language, mainhin. It means timid. She can be a bit timid. She can be, and she's helpful. She's full of joy. She's laughing and everything. But then she's got that feistiness, and and that that she will just tell you how it is, and and, but at the same time, she can be very loving at the same time, and then just kill you in one minute. I think what, what stands out for me, like, like looking around with my Filipino friends, is that extra, extra generosity, extra kindness. And then when they explode, that's it, you know. And also, they don't, don't treat them bad because Filipinos don't like that. And it comes out, you know, and when there's injustice around them. And if you treat them unjustly. They're not going to stand for that. Most Filipinos, Filipinas that I know. I feel that a common, th well, it's actually, it's, it's very inherent in us, particularly, mm. I was going to say specifically women, but I think it's just in our culture generally that, and it's particularly our mothers, I feel, yeah. who say that you know, to get somewhere in life, you have to work really hard and make yeah. sacrifices. Yes. Yes. Do you think that's a good thing? Uh, definitely working hard has worked for me. But sacrifice, personally, not so much. Because I've never had to live that life. I've never had to sacrifice really for anybody. I mean, I'm sure I do a bit of sacrifice. But, but but not, not to that extent that I have to, to, to forsake my happiness for other people's happiness. Do you understand? Like, like uh, forsake my own happiness for others. Because like, for example, Ami, she'd rather be in the Philippines, really. But she's working as a, you know, as a maid for forever in Australia. I've never had to do that. So to me, I always follow my, my own happiness. And then I can be of service to others. I mean, because I have these conversations with my mum every now and then, and she obviously does makes it a point. She will remind me of her sacrifices. Yeah. But I think it's because it's part of not just Filipino culture, but the the general the migrant narrative as a whole. Yeah, that's true. Of that sacrificing sacrifice. for your kids because yes. your kids are your wealth. Yeah. But in my opinion, and from what I've seen, that sacrifice is good because if for the you know for the family for for your for your loved ones but i don't know if the person who's doing the sacrifice is actually i think it does something to to to, to those people mm. 
in our culture, we express gratitude. We, but I think, to be honest, it does something to the psyche of those people who's doing the sacrificing. They, ha they feel that they've missed out on things in life. And I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. In my previous interviews that I had with Aina, Michelle and Susanna, I actually came, to the qu came with the question of how, what can Westerners learn from Filipino culture? But I actually want to flip it with you yeah. this time around. Yeah. I actually want to ask you, what can Filipinos learn from Westerners? I think it's good if you make yourself happy first. And with Westerners, the first, as I said, after two years, I really saw that. They really look after themselves first before looking after other people. And I love that Filipinos look after their whole family, do sacrifice and all that, but to the point that they're not looking after themselves. So in, in themselves, they're not fully happy. In saying that too, it's all a contradiction because my mother, for example, she gets happiness from helping other people. So what I do is I make her try to make her happy. You know, like, f like now, she's a, she's a senior now, right? So I do what I can to make her happy so she has gasoline, you know, energy to give to other people. And I think, for me, I like looking after myself first and foremost. And I've learned that from, from living in this, in, this, in this society, that you have to look after yourself fir first and foremost. Make sure that you're eating well, that psychologically, emotionally, and, uh, you know, that you're looking after yourself. So that you're not just blindly, you know, trying to earn money and then help other people. Because a lot of people get sick and you don't know how long you're going to be in this world. You know, you've got to look after yourself. Yeah, look after yourself first and foremost, and then look after other people. More broadly speaking, what do you think that viewers can learn from the unusual suspects? Viewers can learn from the unusual suspects. Mm. So all the women have finally said, I'm going to look after myself. This is what I need. I need this money because of whatever reason, right? And we all just went, I'm going to look after myself. And if you look after yourself, everything is going to be okay. I think so. <laughs>